Well, let me tell you something, brother. When I'm working on my 24-inch pythons, dude, I'm listening to Let's Find Out with Diego. Train, say your prayers, and listen to Let's Find Out with Diego. Ooh, what you gonna do, brother, when Let's Find Out with Diego runs wild on you? Are you curious about the unknown, the unexplainable? Do you find yourself intrigued by the mysterious and paranormal side of our world? Join us on an adventure into the world of inexplicable discoveries and investigations that may someday give us the final answer as to what may be behind the veil of reality. The borders of space and time have opened once again and transmitting from the mountains of West Virginia. It's time once again for Let's Find Out with Diego. The universe is waiting for you. <laughs> The borders of space and time have opened once again and transmitting from the mountains of West Virginia. It's another episode of Let's Find Out with Diego. Thank you for taking this journey with me on this episode of Let's Find Out. Our guest is an author, paranormal investigator and researcher that will guide us on a journey to the great state of Pennsylvania. We will go on a tour and learn the mysterious creatures folklore and real life encounters with strange and unusual animals. All this plus more. Please welcome to Let's Find Out, a new friend to the show and author of the book Strange Stories from the Skulking Stream, Volume 1, The Hidden Zoo. Richard Big, Richard, my friend, welcome to Let's Find Out. I'm so happy to have you here on this very beautiful Sunday. Good to be here. Thanks. And, you know, I was holding my breath because uh, I didn't think I was going to get through that introduction with uh, maiming the name of the stream and the whole thing. We just had a conversation about that. Uh, well, this is the best place to learn about it because it's the first time I've heard about this stream. So I came up upon your social media profile. It was randomly, really. It was actually kind of magical. And I was quickly drawn and interested to your book. And to discuss and learn more about the folklore and cryptids in Eastern Pennsylvania, we always love to learn about the different areas in the United States or, or around the world, their folklore and about their cryptids. Um, yeah. Where's the location of this mysterious stream located at? And for me, because you've already told me a thousand times already, what is the proper pronunciation of this location? The river is the Schuylkill River, and it runs between Schuylkill County and at the uh, edge of the Appalachian Mountains down to Philadelphia. Uh, the name Skookal comes from the Dutch skulking stream. Kill means stream, skulk as in hiding. So it's thought that it means a place for hiding or the river that lurks. You're interested in this subject because uh, we talked about, no, we didn't talk about it. I read about that you're also a paranormal investigator. Is this something you've always been into from a young age? And, and two, on that part, what is it about the Eastern Pennsylvania location that's really put you in this journey? I've been into the occult and the paranormal since I was born, um, possibly since before I was born. Uh, my family has some strange stories of what things happening before I was born, but it's something I was always that weird kid that saw shadows and talked to dead relatives. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up in a household with a lot of interesting books on the occult, uh, Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, demonology, that kind of thing. So it's something I've always been interested in. I kind of always knew that I would write a book about it. Uh, I had a tarot reading once in middle school, and she said that you're going to write stories, you're going to go to places and see weird things and write about them. And I kind of said, yeah, I figured that's what I was going to be doing. During that time in your life, well, before the um writing the book because i know it's probably a lot of years it's a big year gaps between mm -hmm. when you, that was told to you and you wrote the book being that you grew up with this and maybe having a family history of with the occult and paranormal what what do you have any stories of things that have happened during that time or this happened to you oh yeah all kinds of stories um <clears throat> When I was little, I used to talk about uh, past lives or talking to uh, my grandfather that had passed away. Um, I've 
seen all kinds of uh, shadow figures and things like that over the years. Um, when I got into paranormal investigation, obviously I went out looking for things. And when you go looking for things in the paranormal, they tend to go looking for you back. And sometimes things come home with you. Sometimes uh, weird coincidences and things like that happen that bring you more into certain uh, other phenomena that you maybe weren't even looking into at first. What would that, so not only your experience, but your family's experience, has there always been some sort of um, paranormal history in your family? I wouldn't say always. Uh, I know that um, in my mom's side of the family, uh, going back to the Salem witch trials, the, the Fisks of Salem were um, members of the jury of the witch trials. On my dad's side of the family has uh, sort of rumors of vampire vampire history. And uh, there's also a, a witch or two on his side of the family. Um, but it's not something that it's like uh, <laughs> Adam's family sort of thing where it's uh, all these kooky, zany people. It's um, just random people in the history of the, the family. With that side of the family... Have you seen pictures of, or any written text from that part of that time? Yeah, um, in the Salem witch trials, uh, after they had found the the witches or the quote unquote witches guilty, the Fisks uh, were actually the foremen of the jury, and they did write a letter of apology stating that they were sorry for what happened during the trials. Um, they felt guilty that. They, they felt that they had sort of been manipulated into uh, guilty verdicts and expressed uh, sorrow that what they had done had led to the bloodshed that it did. It was it's, it's an awful time in our history where, and I'm not fully convinced that these people who were accusing other people were doing it for the good of anybody. I think it's a lot of those either out of spite, jealousy, or just they're actually accusing other people of being witches, but actually the people who were doing the accusations are actually the most evil ones around. Yeah. And um, the next volume of the series actually delves into the witchcraft and magic use in Eastern Pennsylvania. So the next volume is actually going to go into that a little bit. Uh, there's actually some strange coincidences between the Salem witch trials and witchcraft in Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, there were, there was a trial in Eastern Pennsylvania, not the famous one, but soon after that one. So the seven, late 1700s and uh, the people that were accusing the witches in that case had ridden to America on the same boats as the people that went to Salem and did the same thing at Salem. So kind of a strange uh, coincidence, maybe not a coincidence, or a social construct that maybe they brought over from Europe at the time. You know, you know, it's interesting as you're saying what you were saying. It's in a way we're almost repeating the same things now in our modern time, where you can have anybody accuse anybody of anything, and it's almost like a social media and the news is to jury and everybody's always found guilty no matter what even down the road when you say no they never did any of this it, it, uh, it's still there every culture has its buzz buzzwords sometimes it's uh i'm not going to get into which uh political thing but i think both sides do it um and whoever you don't agree with whoever's making you angry at any given moment you just use the right buzzwords and cause that person a lot of grief True, and it's you know it's still it's it's one of this the age old thing of we don't learn from our past, so that's why we repeat it every time. Yeah. So, what is it about Eastern Pennsylvania that got you to write a book about the folklore and stories from that part of the state? Because are, were you born and raised there? Yeah, mostly because I'm from here, so it's uh, something that I grew up with. A lot of the stories. Um, Growing up, there were, uh, because I was into the occult and into strange phenomena, I was reading the local stories, reading the, the history books that talk about the folklore and the weird 
history and things like that. So I was already familiar with a lot of it growing up here. And some of it is sort of a microcosm of the paranormal elsewhere. I mean, you have the same sort of uh, wild man and wild beast stories everywhere in the world. Um, but some of it is particular to Pennsylvania because of our history and because of the uh, the geography of the area. There are a few valleys in particular that I cover throughout the book series, uh, like the Tumbling Run Valley. Uh, it's a long, straight, narrow valley, not very populated, but there's a huge concentration of suicides, missing people, uh, monster reports, uh, reports of witchcraft, reports of shadowy figures, all kinds of weird things in this narrow valley where there really aren't many people to even tell the stories. You know, and that's very interesting, which is why I asked the question a few seconds ago, because each state has their own version of probably what the same creature might be. Yeah. So if we were to talk about the wild men of the woods, a couple things come into mind. Um, possible Bigfoot or maybe feral humans. Where mm-hmm. where are we going with uh, as far as the wild men of the woods? Because at least at least here in West Virginia, we can always say, well, it's pretty much either going to be a Sasquatch or Bigfoot. How is it up there in Pennsylvania? Same. Uh, throughout history, these things have been called by different names. Eastern Pennsylvania has the Lenape, uh, the Native Americans from Eastern Pennsylvania. They have stories of a figure called Mesingue. Uh, Mesingue is a large, hairy man. He was the proto-human that came before humans. Uh, The great spirit gave him uh, use of the forest, and he now protects the forest and makes sure that hunters that go into the forest are respectful of the game animals. They have stories of the Muwe, which is similar to uh, Wendigo from other nations um so there are there's a cross reference between something that's pre or proto-human and there are stories of things that are possibly human and maybe they change for some reason um in european culture we have the werewolf and uh things like that well let me let me ask you this because Native Americans have had a long history where in, in stories about either giants or what we call a Sasquatch today, where they either lived amongst them, hunt with them, or maybe even gone to war with them somehow. There seems to be a very deep connection between these wild men, the Bigfoot and Native Americans, but it seems that maybe that doesn't happen as much anymore. Is it because was the connection more with the Native American tribes? And then once the Europeans came here, there was a lot of mistrust towards them. That's why you don't really see them as much. The stories, you don't no. see the stories as much, or the you don't, you don't see the stories as much, or even perhaps the uh, the connection that they had with the Native Americans. You don't really see that connection with with the Europeans came here. Yeah, I think that there was uh, an era in Europe where. The, where they did see these things more often. And I think around the time of the Enlightenment, uh, when science took over, you tended to see fewer of them. Um, so I think during the time of colonialization, there were fewer, there were, people had less of an idea of what these things were. So when you talk about whether it's literally a wild man, like a human, or if it's a different species, I think that there's a history of both and also our conception of it sort of sort of changed. Uh, over the years, people have thought of it as wild humans in the woods and they've thought of maybe humans returning to a feral state, kind of like how pigs, when you let them out of a, an enclosure, will eventually grow long bristly hair and get more muscular and get bigger. So maybe humans would do the same thing. I don't necessarily think that, but uh, I think that there's some crossover between the idea of non-human wild man and people living in a wild state 
sort of reverting to a wild man form, at least in folklore. And I think I could subscribe to it because I can think even outside of folklore. So let's say, for instance, things are unstable in a country and everybody either loses electricity, they're going to lose internet, they're going to lose easy food stores. It's not going to take long before man devolves back into a wild state. But from man, now we're talking about beasts. Well, we're talking about a mysterious Black Panthers that have been named the Cougar of Pennsylvania. Uh, is Pennsylvania known for the big cats or wild cats in the forest? It's funny you ask that because uh, Pennsylvania is known for having mountain lions. Uh, right now, as of 1874, I believe, the last mountain lion was supposedly killed in Pennsylvania. So uh, almost 200 years ago, the Pennsylvania Game Commission says that mountain lions are extinct in Pennsylvania. They say that there are no wild mountain lions in the state. So I like to joke that maybe they put up signs around the border saying no wild uh, cat entry and all of the wild cats just turn around at the border. But according to the Pennsylvania Game Commission, mountain lions do not exist in Pennsylvania. They say that there was a uh, subspecies the Eastern mountain lion. And they say that that one went extinct in the 1870s, but genetic testing of the, uh, the skins have shown that there are no genetic changes or no genetic difference between those supposed Eastern mountain lions and any other mountain lion that is native to anywhere else. So the whole idea of there being an Eastern subspecies is actually false. Uh, although we do have these stories still of black cats with strange faces that don't match the description of normal mountain lions. And is that similar to what we were talking about on the pre-interview? Because I talked about the screaming black beasts that appear yeah. once in a generation. Is that the same one? So when they're talking about it appears once every generation to terrorize the towns, folks around that river, if we're talking about the, those big cats and maybe people are not accustomed to seeing them, so maybe they have different um, descriptions of what they've seen, right? Yeah, some people describe something more similar to a mountain lion, but with black fur. Uh, mountain lions genetically cannot have black fur. It's just not in their genetics to have melanism. Uh, melanism would cause the entire body to be black. Whereas a lot of these sightings describe animals with black fur on top and white on the bottom, which would be a natural fur color rather than a mutation. The Eastern quote unquote, Eastern mountain lion or the Mount, the cougar of Pennsylvania. Uh, that story goes back to the 1700s when people were first exploring the state and seeing these animals. Uh, they said that there were mountain lions here that were different than mountain lions elsewhere. Uh, so Every generation, like I say, they they come back or people find that find them out anew. I don't know why or how exactly science sort of forgot about them between the 1700s and say the late 1800s, but it was thought that they were extinct or people just forgot that they were there. And sometimes they just come back and cause havoc among the, the farming communities along the river. The fact that they attack along the river actually fits with uh, Native American stories of the water cougar. They also call it Mishipishu or the, the underwater panther or underwater cougar. Uh, so it's like a boogeyman or a, a semi-physical spiritual creature that they believe lived in rivers. And we have physical stories and pictures of the attacks and aftermath of these animals. Now, do you think that perhaps every once in a while you start seeing them? I'll take, for instance, my area, especially in the Northern Virginia, DC area and West Virginia to where sometimes you start seeing a lot more deer or black bear, you know, they get hit on the highways or uh, on the roads or you start seeing them in your backyard Mostly in this area, it's because it's growing so quickly that they're tearing down so much forest, putting them, putting up new businesses or divisions yeah. that 
it draws them out and you'll start seeing them more because they're looking for a new place to or to eat. Yeah, I don't I don't think that I've noticed that in the literature in the history. I think it's mostly that they it's just that they tend to come out when they want to. There's there's like a repeating pattern of events where every time that they come out they tend to follow the river like i say they come out when the weather is bad and they're very good at evading or evading humans so they tend to know when people are out looking for them every time that this happens there are groups of people going out into the woods armed with whatever weapon they can carry and i think that the animals tend to understand humans or how they act they know how to avoid humans uh if we're talking about a species of black mountain lion type animals they we don't have any in zoos currently they have been in zoos in the 1700s but right now we don't know where where to find them or where they live so i think they either are partially cryptic uh somehow hidden from normal society i'm trying to not not get into the paranormal side of it just staying in the cryptozoological side but uh they definitely uh sit that sit on that fence very well between what we know of as a normal animal and i mean they they've been seen with bigfoot there are sightings in uh ohio and uh missouri i think where bigfoot are seen with these cat-like animals with weird faces that are described very similar to how they describe the the banshees or uh the what's or whatever you want to call them you know and, and it's okay because sometimes the paranormal ufology or cryptozoology sometimes we kind of cross streams using yeah. ghostbusters reference and Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't, but in this case, I think it might. Now, with the folklore and the cryptids in, in Pennsylvania, each state in the United States has their own, I'm going to say, franchise cryptids. So, you know, we have a Bigfoot here. We have yeah. we have Mothman, but we also have some lesser known cryptids that haven't really made it to this mainstream. Like for us here, um, we're talking about the Flatwoods Monsters, we're talking about Sheep Squatch, and we have um, Snarly Yow. What are the lesser known cryptids in Pennsylvania um, that we can learn from you about? Well, in the book, there's a case of a jackalope. Uh, it was a one horned rabbit. Actually, I saw that very close to where I live. And um, I thought that it was probably a, a rabbit with the show papilloma virus, which is the current understanding of where we think that jackalope stories come from. So. Uh, there's a, an actual real life jackalope story in the book. Uh, we have giant snakes in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. I think Pennsylvania as a state, the I think our big cryptid is probably the Raystown Ray. That's out uh, west of here. That's not in the book, but I think that's probably the big state uh, cryptid. Um, we've got Wolfman, Dogman. Uh, we have uh, some stranger things that I'm saving for maybe a later uh, future version. I tended to try to keep it on the, the more mundane side for the first volume and sort of build up the, the strangeness as we go. Uh, you'll see that throughout the book and then throughout the series that I'm trying to keep it a little bit grounded to start off. And then we do have some stranger things. There's a snake with ears. There's a goat man flying light type of creatures there's something described as like a heron but with a glowing patch on its chest we have a dragon close by here uh, described as just a glowing snake-like form that would uh, rise up out of the ground and into the mountainside um, yeah there's all kinds of weird stuff going on no it's you know funny you mentioned about a snake i just just today I just got this six foot black snake out of trying to get into my garage today. I was climbing the walls near the door. Yeah. And it's my first ever time trying to wrangle a snake. It took me, <laughs> it 
took me a while with my wife's help, but you know, I, I don't kill. I just find a way to get out of there, put in a container, take the pickup yeah. truck and put it across town. But um, that's not important. It just really came to me because it just happened about three hours ago. It's, it's great. With <laughs> um, going back to the beginning of the show where you mentioned somebody gave you a reading and that reading foretold of you going to be eventually writing a book in the future. When you finally decided to write a book about what we were just talking about, did that light hit on your in your brain and say, oh, my God, somebody did tell me I was going to write a book? I think it was more of uh, just something that was always in the back of my mind as something that I was going to eventually do. Um, some people dream of being an astronaut or whatever. I just always kind of knew in the back of my mind that I was going to write a book about paranormal stories or uh, when I first started the book, I wanted it to be more about um, people's personal stories. Uh, there's a book series of Eastern Pennsylvania or of Pennsylvania in general called Pennsylvania Fireside Stories. I was aiming for something similar to that, but of course I started writing it during the pandemic. So uh, having interviews with people that I didn't know was not really going to fly. So I went more in with the uh, research and historical accounts. And when you were gathering this information about the historical accounts and the stories, did you interview people themselves? Or did you go through like old news articles to find out more about these things? Both. I, I tried to interview as many people as I could. I didn't get in touch with too many because like I said, uh, it was during the height of COVID lockdowns. Uh, it was tough to reach out to people. Uh, so I, most of the book is mostly uh, old news stories, uh, history, history books um, from the early times, talking about things that were happening contemporarily to the time that they were written. Uh, just stories from the historical society, uh, things like that. And of course, a few personal stories thrown in there. Also going back to the beginning of the show, where we mentioned something about your paranormal investigations. Quite different than going out into the woods, searching for several things. Each one has its own level of danger. What's one of more, one of your more memorable paranormal investigations, and what did you see? One of the biggest ones for me was uh, it took place in a place that I used to work. It's a place local to here. Um, it used to be a children's home. Um, right now, it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, so when we investigated there, it was just in response to a few people that worked there seeing a lady dressed like a nurse and um, a few sounds of children being heard in the building. Uh, we used a Frank's box, which was a little box. Uh, it's basically a radio that continually scans through radio stations. It doesn't stop. So you just hear a weird staticky noise. And the idea is that spirits can interact with that and that you can hear them speaking. So we got really lucky on that occasion. The The Frank's box did work really well. We got a really good response and it ended up, it was actually an initial investigation. It wasn't really, it was more of a walkthrough and then things just, started happening and you started having full conversations with these spirits. And we had, I'd say about a two hour conversation with a male and a female spirit. Uh, you could hear their voices. They, they sounded distinct. They gave intelligent responses to the questions that we were asking. They talked about things that uh, happened in the history of the building uh, so that story is actually told in one of the local books around here uh, by uh, Charles Adams. Uh, he covered that investigation a few years ago. Uh, I'd say that was probably my favorite, one of my favorite investigations because uh, it was just a nice, 
chat with a couple of spirits and just a two-way conversation, which you don't have a lot of the time. Normally, you're just sitting there with a recorder, kind of talking to yourself, pretending there's somebody there. So it's good to have feedback and have a, a two-way conversation with spirits, even if they might be, they might not say as much or go into as much detail as you'd like when you're trying to get information about the afterlife. And so how do you prepare yourself when you conduct these investigations? So I think everybody has their own way of doing it, but seeing that you're a man of experience in this type of thing. So what do you do to prepare yourself? I think of hauntings as a, a form of trauma, a, a past life trauma where, uh, when somebody has post-traumatic stress disorder, they're in a state where they're um, feeling not safe, they're confused, uh, they might lash out or have anger, uh, they might relive past experiences. These are all things that we see in hauntings as well. And trauma is normally measured by how close one gets to death. So you, by logic, you would assume that when somebody dies, their trauma would be pretty profound and uh we do see in hauntings that some sometimes people seem to be confused about their time or place it seems that time flows differently there or doesn't flow in the sense that we tend to think of it so when i'm preparing for an investigation i tend to go in with that mind frame that i'm going to be talking i might be talking to somebody who's traumatized I might be talking to, I mean, you normally don't see the the spirit that you're talking to. So it's kind of like the internet. You don't know who you're talking to. So you have to assume the worst. So you go in with a, a, a mindset of I'm there to help. Uh, I'm there to try to learn something to help both the client as in the, the person that hired or, or asked me to investigate their house and I'm going in to help potentially a traumatized spirit. And I also have to be mindful of the fact that it might be something other than a human spirit. I'm not one of those people that thinks that uh, every haunting is demonic or that uh, everything is necessarily evil that you're going to run into. Um, but it is something you have to keep in mind and be mentally and spiritually prepared for. And that's, Sometimes trauma is its own demon, you know. Very true. And it's something I was just going to ask you, but you actually, you said something about it because it's been in my experience and from also interviewing other people, not all hauntings are people, but something else. Um, in your opinion, what are those something else? What are those things? There are, there are a number of different types of hauntings. Um, I think that there's, there are a lot that are what they call residual hauntings, where uh, you have uh, emotionally charged events that sort of leave a mark on the place. And um, we tend to experience them at later times. So I think there's some of that. I think that there's some of non-human entities or uh, spiritual creatures or beings that have never been human that maybe interact with us in a way that appears like a haunting. I think that there are probably, there's probably some nature of reality that we just have no understanding of and maybe can't understand that sort of manifests as a haunting, but maybe if we could look at it from outside or from a greater perspective, we would see was something completely unexpected and totally different. Um, I think that there is a, a combination of factors and a combination of causes. Uh, some of the stranger haunting cases that I've been on, the feedback that we get from the spirits or the, the stories that they give us don't match the known history of the place, which is odd because it's sort of either something completely different than what we would expect to be a spirit or it's something that's lying to us and is it pretending to be a human spirit so it's really it's really tough to say with spirits that 
I'll say once were human and the spirits who were for all purposes were not humans. Are we able to communicate with them the same way? Some, I think it mostly relies it, regardless. I think it relies mostly on their end, whether they're able, willing, and capable of uh, taking on. If you're going to communicate with somebody, you need to have a common language or a common understanding. And I think that there are spiritual forces out there that it's probably nothing to them to interact with a human in a way that we would understand. I think there are probably spiritual forces or beings out there that might be so alien that their best way of communicating to us just appears to be something phenomenal or phenomenological. Uh, I think some UFO cases might fall under that category. I think some uh, high strangeness paranormal type stories where you have the strange coincidences and things might be entities from so so far removed from what our human experience is that their attempt to communicate with us might be so far outside of causal cause and effect past present future context that we just can't really understand them even if they do try true because and i'll just throw this out there as just my opinion i'm not really trying to sway anybody into anything but let's just say that the what we consider the the human race. Let's just say we go back about ten to twenty thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and in my opinion, there was a possibility of other type of races that were intelligent that were not human, that perhaps either some sort of um, climate crisis could have been an asteroid. It could have been anything that somehow wiped them off the face of the earth. So there's a possibility that we can still communicate with them in a spiritual way, but they're going to have, as you say, a different historical perspective of how things are as to what a human spirit would be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you interact with the, the ghost of a highly evolved praying mantis from 12 billion years ago or something like that? You know, how do you uh, communicate with the ghost of something that was, uh, the, the spirit of a dinosaur evolved to the intelligence of a human. And maybe those are the some of the things that we're interacting with that we call demons or who knows. Right. I mean, it, it could be anything from spirits of the reptoids or the, any of the pre-Adamic race that was here before. You know, it, it can be anything. And I guess it's sometimes it depends on how you are brought up and how you interpret the message or what you think it could be yeah and like i say i think it's mostly on their end that we we need to rely on them to communicate clearly or in a way that we can understand because we're not we don't have the understanding of even what what we're talking to a lot of the time that's true and then i'll ask you i'm sorry no you're good i'll ask you uh one last time before we go because we're running up on the clock here. Has there been a time where even the most experienced investigators sometimes comes across a case that kind of makes you feel a little bit different than the last time, or maybe something follows you home and it takes a while to, I'll say, shake it off or in lack of a better word. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Yeah, I've had uh, some cases where maybe the client was under the influence of something. Um, there was a case in, I want to say, Lehigh County. Uh, a gentleman thought that he could take care of the, the spirit or whatever it was. Um, I think that that was a non-human entity. It presented itself as human, but there were aspects of it that went beyond what you would see from a normal haunting. Um, so in that case, uh, it was weird. We went into, it was the, the only time I had ever been touched by a spirit. I'm normally, they tend to shy away from me for some reason. Um, but this was the first time that I actually felt the sort of cobwebby feeling of something touching me when 
the client was talking about. Yeah. And sometimes it'll grab your hair or touch your face. And as he's saying that, I felt something do that. Um, during that case, we, the, there was an active area of the house. It was a, an upstairs uh, closet. Uh, they had a photo of a shadow figure uh, from just outside there. Um, I'm looking in the closet and I see the number 10 carved into the wall. I went into the closet and I look up and I see another one. And pretty soon before you know it, I'm walking throughout the house, moving furniture away from the wall. And there's the number 10 carved into the wall all over the house. It's carved into like the bottom of, it's carved into places that you don't normally see, like the inside of a drawer, uh, the inside of a cabinet, the space above the door inside a closet. We asked the, the client what, the significance of the number 10 might be maybe his kids carved it and thought that, you know, maybe number 10 is one of their favorite uh, race cars or uh, sports figures or something. And he said, no, I don't, I have no idea. I've never seen any of these before. And now that you point them out, I see they're everywhere all over the house. So that was a weird thing. And then as that case went on, the client sort of started to feel like he could take care of it himself and got more difficult with us coming back to help him get rid of it. At the same time, we were getting, the, the team was getting visitations by a shadowy figure that resembled uh, what the client had taken a picture of. I had uh, a figure in my closet at my house that would watch me while I'm sleeping. I would wake up in the middle of the night and see it standing in my closet. I kept my closet door closed but I would wake up to it open with a, a figure inside the closet staring at me and wake up in the morning and the closet door would still be open. Um, my friend on the, the case, um, he has an upstairs or he had an upstairs apartment and he heard his front door open and close and somebody running up the stairs full force, full speed. He said he went for his gun because he thought that he had an intruder that was going to bust through his door when it got to the top of the stairs. He opened the door and there was nobody there. And he said that he also saw this shadowy figure uh, in the middle of the night. So it was something powerful enough to influence all of us, despite the, the prayers and protective measures that we take and strong enough to convince the client that he could take care of it himself. He eventually did uh, tell us he didn't feel like we'd need to come back. He was going to handle it. So I don't know what happened to that case, but for at least a couple of years after that, uh, everybody on the team was getting these visitations. What the, the UFO community nowadays calls it the uh, hitchhiker effect. It's something that's been known in the paranormal community for a lot longer than that. Well, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure... For a bet, man, I'm pretty sure that client may not have had anything taken care of. So uh, probably with him for the rest of his life if he doesn't take care of that. Or at least have somebody assist him with that. Yeah, and he might not notice it. Or it might be manipulating him subconsciously. Or uh, you never know. I, I wish him well. I hope that he does get it taken care of or that the thing gets bored and goes away. But I'm, I'm hopeful, but I, I don't bet on it, like you say. I hope so too, my friend. Now, for the listeners of Let's Find Out, they want to learn more about what it is that you do, your investigations, and want to know more about your book and want to and they want to follow you on your social media. Where can they go? I would go to richardbig.com. That's Richard Big with two G's, B I G G dot com. Uh, that's uh, the website for the book. I have a few uh, things on there, uh, event cup cup. Upcoming events are going to be on there. Um, I'm hoping to start putting a few stories on there just to get people interested in what they can look at when they get to the book. But uh, for right now, it's just information about the book. Uh, I'm on social media. You can link to that on uh, through the website. So if you just go to the website, you can find anything else there. Excellent, my friend. And I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing not only your personal experiences, but stories from your investigations. And 
when that second book comes out. I'd like to be the first to invite you to come back so we can talk about that book as well. Will do. Next one's about witchcraft and magic use. So I'll, I'll uh, keep you in the loop. Thank you, my friend. This has been another excellent episode of Let's Find Out with Diego. Please check us out on all our social media pages, YouTube, or also on Rumble. Like, share, and subscribe. Also, Let's Find Out is now on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. Catch the show on Saturdays at 2 a.m. For more information, please visit KGRADB.com. That's KGRADB.com. Thank you for taking this journey with me. Until next time, my friends. Let's find out with Diego, the power of Diego mania. All content for Let's Find Out is property of co-host Diego and is served directly from our servers with no modification, redirects, or rehosting. All celebrity impersonators are paid performers. The impersonated celebrities do not endorse or promote any views or opinions expressed by our guests, co-host Diego, or Let's Find Out. The information shared on Let's Find Out is provided on an as-is basis with no guarantees of completeness, accuracy, usefulness, or timeliness.